truck it i'm dooner here with michael vincent the dude hey good monday afternoon from freight alley and a very happy birthday to my beautiful daughter may elise vincent oh. eight years old today my all right friend. let's bring her a little something yeah. happy birthday to you happy, happy birthday, birthday to you happy, happy birthday, birthday dear may elise vincent <laughs> happy <laughs> birthday <laughs> to you hey Congratulations, eight years yeah, old. Right on, man. Big deal. One yeah. year older than my oldest son. Yeah, oh, that, that, there you go, right? Stuff. Yeah, we're both in the same uh, pot here. Yeah. You got two boys, I got two girls. Two though. boys. By the way, you might notice this wind turbine here. That's yeah, I did uh, notice port, that. Port of Vancouver, USA is going to be back on the show. They're talk about how they bring these into the port and Very cool. the big heavy and wide corridor oh, in the yeah. Columbia River and how that yeah. connects the west to uh, Asia. Yeah, because those, I mean, they're solid blades coming in, right? Yeah, that's yeah. big stuff. Forget that, cool. though. It was, sad. Cool. it was a sad weekend, man. Every team I was backing in the playoffs, they got knocked out. No Predators, no Pens, no Bruins. Hell, even the Leafs got knocked out, too. What about, like, the Lightning or the Avalanche? No. Those are fake teams. So those I gotta, are I'm, fake gonna, teams. I'm putting everything <laughs> behind, uh, I got to put everything behind the Oilers now. Original Six or whatever. Edmonton that's Oilers. Got to go with Edmonton. Okay, all right. Edmonton. Why not? I always liked way, Edmonton. Speaking of weeks, right now you might look like uh, the Bruins or uh, Penn's overtime line change. It's road check week until the 19th. They're looking at your wheel ends this year. Little fact for you, approximately 15 trucks a minute on average will be pulled over during this event to do those wow. inspections. 15 minutes? I think it makes a dent in capacity. I've asked a lot of truck drivers. You park in the truck. Diesel's record high. Spot rates aren't getting any better. Contract rates aren't getting any better. And a lot of them said, you know what? Not yet. Not yet. No, oh, still going out there. <laughs> still bad. <laughs> you, uh, you think it's going to impact capacity at all? Um, this year, uh, you know, I, you know, it always does a little bit. I don't know yeah. if we're going to notice it that much with everything down already. So, right. I mean, it's kind of interesting of what does affect the numbers and what doesn't. But yeah, it always people do uh, set up. Well, it seems like the rest of the world has finally gotten woke too to sort of what we've been talking about in these conditions in the market. And they're not yeah. just seasonal. They're not just temporary. Right. So, hey, look, drivers. Even though they're going down, the rates are still better than they're probably going to be in a month. So I don't blame you for <laughs> yeah, getting out there. Just make sure those wheel ends are okay. You check your truck out. Everything will be cool. Um, let's hit the ban. Net zero emissions by 2035. That's the headline from AIT Worldwide mm-hmm. Logistics Sustainability Report. But just one aspect of their overall commitment to corporate social responsibility, whether it's protecting the planet, nurturing the communities where we live and work, or ensuring high-quality business continu- continuity, AIT is taking action today to deliver a better tomorrow. Learn more at Tell em, Dude. Hey, go to AITWorldwide.com immediately after this show. Headlines! Yeah. What's going on in the world today? Ah, oh, the prom. That wonderful time of year where we make memories and <laughs> yeah. end up at war with our school, right? Farm Boy denied his truck on prom entrance. Rooster has a story on backthetruckup.com. But what happened over here, we got a picture of this kid. Come on, show this yeah, kid man. Here. This no. is Lance Reed right here. That's right. Sh- Shane Brock on Facebook. She writes, here's my little Lancey, Lance Reed. He works his ass off every single day, day in and day out. Proud employee of Gurky Farms. He was so proud to drive his semi to prom and look sharper than a ballpoint pen. Ballpoint pen sharp? I don't know. A qu- wouldn't it more like a quill pen be sharp? Maybe yeah, not. it would be sharper. Well, anyways, although the lovely principal of Lincoln High School did not think so and denied him into the prom, <laughs> let's take a look at what he's wearing because of what he's wearing. Keep it on that pick. Thank you. Uh, newsflash, it's Lincoln County, Kentucky. He's a farmer. He just turned 18. He's proud, I, I, and the bougie-ass principal thinks it's prom <laughs> in Manhattan. You should be ashamed that you're making his mother bring him other pants <laughs> to change into it doesn't even match his outfit i don't know what pants he had to bring he's wearing a black blazer he's wearing some jeans they look nice his mom had to bring him his other pair of jeans or something like that i don't know whatever it was it didn't look good with his pants she says and instead she says maybe they should focus on them test scores and out of control teenagers that are assaulting your police officers at school and leave the hard-working young man alone that is trying to make something of himself you wow. go cheyenne I'm, I'm with her 100 percent. and what pants go better with that than blue jeans I, I, think I, I don't understand. I, I think those, he looks awesome, man. The whole, look at the truck. I mean, it's well, not even, it's not a gross truck. It's obviously a nice Gherky Farms Peterbilt he's got there with the nice uh, fuchsia lights he has up top and all straight. that. Straight. 
darn straight. And he's going to be the talk of the prom if they even just let him in. Now he's a talk for a totally I mean, different she's, reason. His, his mom's even wrong. She's underselling him. He looks sharper than a ballpoint pen. I'll say that. Absolutely. And, but here's the thing. This has caught an emotional curve with a lot of truck drivers out yeah. there. I'm hearing a lot on social media speak. Here's one. He says, hey, Taylor, this is Greg. We have around 300 truckers who are planning to head towards Lincoln County, Kentucky, in support of Lance Reed. The principal of the house of the high school kicked him out of the prom because he didn't like the Peter building his jeans. How about you come in and join the convoy? So there might even be a, a convoy coming out that way, Michael Vincent. Yeah, you're right. I mean, just a little bit later there. Hey, Taylor, has Greg contacted you about the convoy to Stanford, Kentucky? Apparently the principal of the high school messed w- with one of ours, and uh-huh. we want an apology. 400 trucks ready to roll. This is like a uh, like a 70s trucker movie done right now in 2020 where, you know, it's almost like it. Footloose style, other kid from the other side of the tracks or something. He's got the truck over there. Yeah. The school doesn't think it looks good for their image when they really need to embrace it. There is a school we're going to talk about a little bit later in the show, a different high school uh-huh. that is embracing blue collar work and is embracing drivers through their career fairs and not looking down upon it. Because I think Lance should have been allowed to go to school. A- amen, man. And I, I'm telling you what, their theme, I guess, was kind of Manhattan. I guarantee if he shows up at a high school prom in Manhattan, they're going to love that outfit. Well, he wasn't the Manhattan, or was the mother saying that the school just thought was, the there was, was a Manhattan. quote in one of the news articles that said that the uh, per, the people on the, that were putting on the prom were trying to make it Manhattan-ish. Okay, so all right, well, I'm guessing. I mean, I, that's what I read into it. Anyway. New York, not really. All right, well, here's <laughs> here's a big story too. I know this is every single parent out there concerned. Uh, especially of, of really young kids. Abbott ramps up air cargo imports of infant formula. Eric Coolish has a story on this. You're all aware of it. Abbott Laboratories has turned to air cargo, though, to help overcome domestic shortages of infant formula that are, um, had been exacerbated by a recall in February due to uh, contaminated plants over there in Sturgis, Michigan. Sturgis, Michigan, home to uh, Hog Wild, right? That big, uh, that big biker event every year. The beleaguered maker of Similac and other formula brands said Friday is taking a number of steps to alleviate formula supply Problems with a focus on increased production in its plant in Ireland. It also airshipped millions of cans of infant formula powder from that plant to the U.S. since February. Although, if they've been doing it since February, Michael Vincent, um, it hasn't seemed to help. No, it hasn't. A nationwide out-of-stock average for baby formula reached, what is this, 43% for That's the week scary. ending May 8th. That is unbelievable. And some, uh, according to a technology firm Data Assembly, and several major metro areas are talking 50% or more out-of-stock supply chain disruptions that impacted packaging and raw materials began to slow formula deliveries last year. And the situation got worse after the invasion of Ukraine this year. People searching for this stuff, man. They need it. Of course they need it, man. Abbott Nutrition is the largest infant formula manufacturer in the U.S. They recalled several lines of that powdered formula in mid-February over concerns about that um, bacterial infection that actually killed two people on their... Uh, On their line there, the Biden administration has redoubled efforts to make more formula available in the face of criticism. It was slow to react, and I would say that criticism may be valid. President Biden last week convened a call with manufacturers and retailers to discuss ways to boost production and other initiatives, such as enforcement against price gouging and importing more baby reform for abroad. But here comes the question. If we've known about this since February, right, and it's gotten to the point that it's 43 percent, why is it taking this long? If it was at 15 percent stock out or 20 percent, why aren't the people who are watching this stuff doing something about it? Why are we at the point where it's at 43 percent? And also, what does this say about consolidation, right? This stuff here, we're always like, oh, you know, it's because we get everything over from China or from overseas. This is made right here in the United States. But the problem is you have consolidation where one brand holds so much that it imperils the supply chain with one shutdown. We've got to be careful of this stuff, especially in our food supply chain, Michael. Vincent. Yeah, one hundred percent agree. It's that it's you know we consolidated into China, but we consolidate other things here. It's the just in it's the just in time. It's the efficiency and stuff like that that just doesn't work when things break down. It can't handle the chaos of it uh, disruption. Chaos. It can't handle the chaos, and no. that just shows the danger across any industry. Absolutely, too many. Too much formula in one basket. All right, skyrocketing <laughs> diesel prices. This is another obvious one. Skyrocketing diesel prices affecting U.S. Mexico import rates. Who would guess? Noi Mahomi reports the price of diesel fuel hit an all-time high in the U.S. on Thursday at 5.55 a gallon. I'm sure it'll hit another one this week. Um, that's an increase of almost 20 cents from just a week ago and mm. 51 cents since April. Well, carriers and owner operators across the U.S. are struggling to keep up with the rising prices. That cost of diesel is affecting freight rates across the board and especially with capacity out of Mexico. That's right. Rising diesel prices have already caused some of the larger trucking companies in Mexico to increase rates 3 to 5 percent, according to Maria Teresa Torres, a pricing and procurement manager for uh, Novo, Car- Novo Cargo, a uh, New York-based digital logistics platform. Diesel 
is one of the most important components with any land freight base since it represents 30% of the total cost, Teresa said. The price increase in fuel represents an expense that carriers have to pay for before shipping. Yeah, it's Mexico, unbelievable. In Mexico, but 80% of fleets and are small trucking companies and owner-operators. Not too different than here, right? No. Mexican imports 80% of its fuel from the U.S., but gas and diesel cost less in Mexico because the Mexican government offers the trucking industry subsidies to offset operating expenses right what? there. Last year, Mexico diesel prices stood at about $4 a gallon. As of Friday, diesel in Mexico costs four thirty one dollars a gallon. So about a buck cheaper, so a little bit of offset, at wow. least uh, at the origin side for them. Wow. Government uh, upholding the infrastructure that helps their country run that's yeah. bizarre well we'll see we'll see a <laughs> we'll see. Lot, lot of stuff to keep abreast of stay tuned to yeah. freightwaves.com and back the truck up.com for all your transportation needs and this time we're going to talk to an old friend of ours scott cornell national practice lead for transportation crime and theft specialist at travelers and we're going to yeah. keep it kind of simple this time we're going to just talk about how to get the most value out of a policy you already have or may be thinking of we're excellent trying to reinvent the wheel today Love it. um nice to have you back scott thanks for joining us today Hey guys, how you been? We are doing good. We're just cruising right here, getting into the summertime, hitting towards the dog days of summer, Scott. <laughs> right on, <Cool>. man. <laughs> Thanks well, for having me back. I was listening to the birthday wishes earlier, wishing I could be eight years old again. That would be great, wouldn't it? Oh, I would love to be there. I would love oh, to be there. Man. Although, you know, my kid has a schedule. My kid's eight. He's got kind of a, 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 a hectic schedule. But well, they're different schedules than they were before. It was like, hey, yeah. be home when it gets dark. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they that was my lessons schedule. and all sorts of things. Yeah. He's a busy kid. Yeah. Well, you know what, Scott? We also talked about a story here in the open. Escalating diesel prices, right? The pressure is on trucking companies. And when the pressure's on, you got to find places where you can find value. And one of them mm-hmm. I think you're going to tell us today is in your insurance policy. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I think it's applicable to the things you were talking about. I, I think, you know, as we go forward and we see what the market's going to bear with, you know, expenses and, and it, are you getting everything you can for the dollar you're spending in whatever category you're, you're talking about. So when you talk about insurance, cargo insurance tends to be one of the smaller lines uh, that you look at with your cargo insurance. But it's also where you're going to get a lot of value because that's, you know, where a lot of times that's where you have the most activity is around the cargo claims and the cargo insurance. So you know, let's let's see, you know, are you getting real value out of that? So the question becomes, if you're spending good money, you're spending a good amount of money on insurance as a whole, what's behind it? What else are you getting for the dollar that you're spending? And some of these things may not usually cross your mind, but they're things you should think about. Yeah, you know, that is an excellent, excellent point. So what, what can trucking companies really expect to get out of their policy besides, you know, just good cargo coverage? I think the first thing that I always think about is excellent claim services. You know, remember when you have a claim, sometimes it's not just you dealing with the claim. Sometimes it's your customers. Sometimes, you know, you have other parties involved. So it's important that that go well for you. So when you're thinking about what insurance company you're going to pick, you know, what do they offer when it comes to claims? Is it, you know, um, how, how are you, how are they going to help you be better in the event that you have a claim? What can you expect in terms of, you know, getting a hole again, getting your drivers and your trucks back on the road? Do they have a really good reputation in the trucking industry? And in particular, what you do in the trucking industry or the transportation industry as a whole? Are, are they going to provide additional resources for you? Uh, insurance companies that employ people that have backgrounds in trucking are a big asset. You know, we have in our claim department here, we have people who have worked in the claim or worked in the trucking industry, whether it's in the claim Uh, area or in the legal area, we have that experience. So they see it from both sides of it. They've walked in your shoes, so to speak. Interesting. Right. So claim services, what else? Well, uh, a topic that the three of us have discussed a lot in the past is theft and recovery prevention, Mm. right? So um, theft, you know, unfortunately, it's no secret that theft is an issue that uh, the transportation industry deals with. Uh, there's a, there's millions of dollars behind that, and, and the thieves are just getting smarter. They're getting more aggressive. Um, so you want to make sure that your insurance carrier is on top of theft. What do they offer you when it comes to theft? We've discussed, uh, the three of us have discussed that here at Travelers, we have our own special investigations group that's uh, one of the largest, most comprehensive investigative units in the country, and they investigate cargo theft on behalf of our clients 24-7, 365, and then they also work with our clients to teach them how to prevent theft in the first place. Uh, I've also mentioned in the past that we have a sting trailer that we use. And sometimes we should spend more time talking about the sting trailer, but it's, you know, equipped with surveillance and tracking and it's designed to break up active organized cargo theft rings. So 
as an example, a few months back, um, we had a trucking customer who was getting hit by a uh, professional, what we call pilfered ring, where they're just taking a couple of pallets off the back of the park trucks. And it wasn't just our client, it was other, other trucking companies out there. We work with law enforcement, they, they put the stink trailer out and we were able to uh, catch them and break up that ring. So, you know, what kind of impact are they bringing to that type of loss that you're dealing with that somebody else may not have a solution for? Yeah, absolutely. So, Scott, you know, at Travelers, you got you got the claim services, you got theft recovery and prevention, you've got the sting trailer, you've got all these things that are going on. What possibly anything else could you guys be doing? Um, I think risk control is important too. Uh, you know, <clears throat> do you have an experienced risk control? We talked earlier, of, you know, a couple of seconds ago about bringing in people who are experienced in the trucking industry. In our risk control department, we have specialized risk control people, and some of them have a background in trucking. Uh, you know, they've come from that industry or they've spent time in that industry. Some of them, even their families were involved in it. So, you know, can they offer suggestions on, you know, warehousing? on uh, safety? Can they help you with driver selection? You know, you spoke uh, at one point, uh, I think a, a couple of, maybe a month ago with Adam, who's from our fire investigative team. Mm -hmm. And truck fires are an issue in the industry. So is there a risk control department there that can help you go through things that may help you prevent fires or minimize that risk or, or, or reduce that risk for fire? And if you do have a fire, then do you have someone like Adam that you spoke to with us that can investigate that fire? Uh, do they offer training? Uh, you know, can they come out? I think a good provider will come out, back up their actions with training, uh, whether it's with the risk control department or with the claim department. You know, our claim department will actually work with a client's claim department to share experience, share knowledge. And the same thing with the risk control department. Can can their risk control people work with your risk control people, whether it's on training or getting good process and procedures in place to help prevent losses? All great points, Scott. Make your policy work for you and mm -hmm. go to work for you, especially now when operating costs are going to get tougher than ever. This Amen. is really where you want to start under yeah. looking under those rocks and highlighting the experiences that your partners need. People who want to reach out, they want to learn more. Where do we send them to, Scott? Travelers.com slash transportation resources. There we go. Easy That's enough. It. We will go send there. them over there. Scott, you have a great week. Thank, thank you for coming on today. Have a great week, guys. Take care. Take it easy. Amen. Now, yep. I've been thinking about this. Uh, I've been thinking about Lance Reed and his prom. And um, I was going to say it's got to be about the seventies. Well, I, I want to, yeah, I want to pitch. <laughs> I want to pitch a script because I think okay. this could be a great script. We could bring like a renaissance. We've been talking so much about <laughs> how no movie has highlighted a, like a trucking hero since Sling and Hawk. And no, the ice road doesn't count because Liam Neeson was like a complete jerk to his brother in that movie. Yeah, like, he, he was a hero. Like the, he wasn't a hero. He's kind of a jackass. Yeah. Well, what about Lance Reed? Let's make the movie about Lance Reed. So I like it. Yeah, Lance Reed. He go, like he's going to go to the prom, right? That's like yes, the first act. That he goes is it. to the yes. prom. It's the story we Got the all premise. know. Got the, the principal kicks him off, right? Yeah. He gets embarrassed as he goes there. The uh -huh. local, like, yuppie bullies, like how they're trying to get that Manhattan image, that's got to represent some side of the tracks there. Those guys, Karate Kid style, they're like the Cobra Kai. They're jumping Lance Reed. Okay. So we got so we, so we we got Footloose, we got uh, Karate Kid, yep. and we got 16 Candles now, so far. But in Act 2, in. the great Bambino, right? Freight Bambino? Yes, our hero. He sees what's happening online. He sees the Back the Truck Up Twitter account. He, yeah, he gets wind of the story. He rounds up the boys, right? He so starts he's training rubber racing. He even tan t he even teaches Lance how to how to how to dance because you got Lance's one mistake is he didn't have love at the prom. He had a girl, but he didn't have love yet. So he helps him find love. He teaches him how to fight, and then at the end of the movie, he's yeah. about to get jumped by all the uh, like the, the Cobra Kai guys, yeah, right? Yeah, the yeah, 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 yeah. And then the convoy rolls in, and you see like all the headlights, the trucks. You hear the. Uh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So it's like Mercedes and Porsches oh, yeah. against Peter and, and then at uh, the end, it's just like a massive Max. dance scene with all these truckers <laughs> dancing and Lance is dancing and everything. Love and like it, the man. boys. And at the end of the movie, he's walking off in the sunset with the girl. Yeah. And they go, Lancey, where are you going to college? And he turns around and he goes, I'm going to trade school. <laughs> Boom, roll credits. There <laughs> it is. Boom, there it is. I love Let's it. Let's make the movie. I like it. Yeah. All right. Speaking of making Start big deals, tomorrow. big deals, getting funded, you know, building the next future of trucking over here. It's Brett Suma, CEO over at Loadsmith, and he has a couple cool developments to talk with us about today. Brett, thanks for coming back on the show. Gentlemen, it's nice to see you guys. Brett, I didn't I don't think I saw you in Arkansas. Were you avoiding me? 
Uh, I wasn't there, um, <laughs> unfortunately, I, and I should have been because we have an office in Northwest Arkansas. But uh, uh, I my my travels took me to uh, Chicago and Milwaukee last week. See, I thought he got <sighs> stuck in that escape house we saw on the way over there. He couldn't get out. <laughs> there, was, there was an escape house on the uh, side of the road. Well, we want to congratulate you, though, because you recently raised a little bit of money. You recently had a new partnership and all these cool things. So get us up to date. What's going on? What is the funding that you got? And what's this deal with Mastery that's going on? Well, I don't know. The funding thing is news to me. So... Um, I think oh, checks, in mail, have, oh, oh, <laughs> checks in the mail, Brett. Checks in the mail. Checks in the mail, dude. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, I'll go check it today. Um, no, uh, as far as funding goes, no, we've um, we haven't brought any on on any funding. We, we've been uh, very fortunate from from the very beginnings of our business that that we've been able to be profitable and been able to um, do very well um, in in the industry. And so uh, from a funding perspective, no news there, but we we are the new uh, the newest customer of Mastery Logistics, something that we've been working on internally for a while uh, in terms of getting that announcement ready. And we are going to be migrating to Mastery and couldn't be more excited about the product that Mastery is and the opportunity that we have really to, to enhance our service offering uh, with our shippers and with our carriers. Excellent. So, Brett, let, let's dive into that just a little bit. What is the service offering that you are bringing and how does Mastery enhance that? Yeah, I, well, I mean, I think that, that when you think about Mastery and, and kind of their founders, they're obviously uh, very, very progressive when it comes to logistics and freight. Um, and, and they're just building uh, the, the next generation of TMS system there. And when we looked at how we wanted to scale our business and the, the vertically integrated platform that we have, when you're talking about uh, brokerage freight, power only freight and an autonomous middle mile, really, we needed something that was going to be very, very robust to help us with all three of those things and really, really work from an optimization perspective, from a digital freight matching perspective. How do we bring our carrier app into that um, and really start building our carrier app that says, OK, we can book it now. So yeah, that's that's easy. But beyond book it now. And looking at power only and looking at our network and a fully integrated uh, autonomous middle mile. And what are our origin destination pairings going to be for this autonomous middle mile? And how do we do power only first and last mile? And, and really, how do we become a force multiplier of really great driving jobs that allow carriers and drivers to, to be successful uh, but be home? And, and we really think that that autonomous middle mile is one part of it. And our capacity as a service platform is taking, you know, essentially our five key, uh, key components. Um, when you look at our market, mm. our carrier driver app, mm. uh, our power only first and last mile, our autonomous middle mile, and then just power only in general, if we're just doing power only that's not um, in, in the autonomous realm. And so uh, really we think that mastery is the next big thing to allow us to, to put all of those components together. You know, Brett, I had the word secured in my head and that's where funding may have come from. But what secured, what I actually want to talk about was the 350 autonomous trucks that you guys got. Yes. That's where my wires got yeah. crossed. Tell us a little bit about the other partnership you have with Too Simple and how that all factors into what you're doing with mastery here and the uh, capacity as a service. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, so we've, we've inked a deal with two symbol for 350 trucks. Uh, we have another, another deal pending for another 150 trucks, uh, through another, another autonomous, uh, manufacturer. And we may look to a third one as well. Um, just so that we have, you know, you know, multiple, multiple baskets that we can work with. Uh, but that 350 is what's public now. And, and, you know, it's something that we want to expand on 350 trucks for us. When you're looking at it from an autonomous perspective actually has the capacity of 875 trucks. And so we have to then go and buy trailers at not a ratio that would be normal to 350 trucks, but really looking at a trailer ratio related to 875 trucks. Um, you know, and, and that capacity as a service platform, really what we're talking about is being very precise in the way that we move freight autonomously uh, on, our, on our middle mile. And so mastery, how mastery plays into that is that mastery is going to, to be 
you know, we'll have a lot of proprietary algorithms in the mastery side that, that really optimize our network for us and tell us, this is how you should move all your freight today. This is what should go on the first, you know, the power only first mile. This is what should be shipped on the autonomous middle mile. This is the, 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 way in which you should ship it autonomously. This is what has to be delivered, you know, on the power only last mile. Um, and then what do we do with the rest of the freight? And not only what do we do with it, but who do we do with it with? And so, you know, that's where you're talking about digital freight matching and incorporating our, our driver app into that. And so, um, you know, whether it's the, the, the 500 autonomous trucks that we have an agreement for now, uh, the, the trailers, the thousands of trailers that we're going to have to, to to bring on in order to make that work from a from a power only first and last mile perspective um, to our driver app kind of connecting our carriers to all of that. Um, so really, really, we've been working on this in stages over the last two and a half years, uh, really. And in, in, in really step one for us was to build a very robust dense network of freight. And so we feel that we have scaled to one hundred and fifty million dollars of freight. And the next step for us is going to be, how do we get to 250 million? How do we get to 500 million? But 500 million with a tremendous amount of capacity as a service middle mile autonomous and a lot of power only first and last mile. Because what we don't want is for anybody to confuse our initiatives with autonomous middle mile to be anti-driver. Um, in fact, we're very, very pro driver. We feel that that our autonomous middle mile actually is a force multiplier of uh, first and last mile jobs. And so we feel that we can create two and a half times the amount of current first and last mile jobs that exist by running that autonomous middle mile. And really, that's kind of the whole capacity as a platform, uh, you know, yeah. initiative. Yeah, so Brett, that makes perfect sense that it would increase that because your middle mile increases, like you said, the 350 is actually 850 or 800 trucks. So you've got that uh, frequency of of truckloads coming into and leaving the 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 first and last mile more frequently, causing more jobs. I think it's brilliant that you guys are attacking both sides, the autonomous and the middle mile, because I think we both agree that that's the most obvious where it's going to would grow up or seems to be one of those. And linking those together, what are the challenges of linking those two together? Because you've got assets changing hands, right, between the first mm -hmm. mile, then the autonomous, and then the final mile. What are some of those challenges to trying to put together that network? Well, I appreciate you asking that question because that's what mastery's job is to solve for us, right? And, and, and that's why when we think about going down the path of doing this, we needed a very, very robust platform of which that we could piggyback off of. And so the challenge is, you know, for the, for the most part, there's a lot of challenges in logistics and transportation related to, you know, pickup and delivery appointments, transit, um, customer expectation, carrier availability, driver hours of service. So when you look at like all of the, you know, math that has to be done in order to, to put out what is the optimal way to move things. Um, and sometimes you have to do things that aren't optimal because that's what the customer's requirement is in that particular load or working with a carrier, getting a particular driver home. There's a lot of complex things. And really the solution for us was mastery will help bring all of those things together uh, because it's purpose built for the next generation or what we're calling internally, like the future of truckload transportation. Brett, what are they telling you about the future of middle mile autonomous trucks? How, how long until this is sort of like ready for prime time and sort of be, it would be pretty normal to be booking an autonomous truck. How long are we talking about here? You know, I'm, I'm very optimistic that that the regulatory and the technology will catch up with each other in 2024. I think that there also are some supply chain issues when you think of if you've been inside of an autonomous truck, the 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 computer and servers um, is overwhelming how much computing power is being done. Yeah. And so and so the number of microchips that these trucks need just without uh, the autonomous component of it. So I, I think that it would be wise to say that you're looking at probably 2025 when regulatory mm. catches up with technology catches up with ready, readily available supply chain issues in terms of microchips. And so I think that that's kind of, you know, 2025 for us is when I think that you're going to really start to see um, a movement towards this autonomous middle mile. 
Well, I'm glad you're already thinking about the trailers, though, because earlier you made like a really good point. You're already considering that you're mm -hmm. going to need those excess trailers. You're not like waiting until the, you're playing with live grenades and being like, oh, you know, never thought of that. Never, Because there'll be plenty of those things that come up anyway. You got to think about the things you can actually see be, beforehand. So good that your, your eyes are in front of it. Now, people who want to learn more about what you're all up to, where do we send them to? Uh, Loadsmith.com is the best place. Love it. I love it. Well, Excellent hey, stuff. thank you so much for coming on the show today. And we'll catch up with you Thank soon. Thank you, down gentlemen. Road. Take care. Take it easy. Right on. Wow, good I'll stuff, stuff, bro. So he, he thinks relatively soon. He makes he made a lot of great points. One of them, is something I hadn't really thought about, was the yeah. number, the extra number of trailers you're going to need. Oh yeah, because you're going to make the all turns. those extra turns. You need trailers. You need that capacity. It's just like uh, containers we needed when we had all those ships filled with them, right? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, containers. There's a lot of inputs them. when it comes to to moving freight. But there it sounds like um, he's really concerned out, and he's pretty optimistic. Though he also mentioned the same thing that we've kind of seen with autonomous trucks. Yeah, we we personally have seen a few. They're not. We're not allowed inside of them most Some of the time. Of them, yeah, we're not yeah. allowed to film inside yeah. of them. We're not allowed to see what's going on inside of them. See how hot some of those servers may be inside of them. I'm not talking about too simple, but some <laughs> other ones see that the uh, hamsters under. That there's a few we've the seen. There's there's some refining that has to be done. Yeah. I mean, we've seen in the electric space too with what they're doing. Some of the electric cars. Yeah, These are obviously. Absolutely. It's still in kind of a beta yeah. stage. You need the early adopters. I think one of the other things to point out about what Brett's doing over there is that their 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 partnership with Mastery. It's not a bunch of newbies over there at Mastery. No, it's just Silver. He's it's been doing this for a while. American Coyote, American Backhaulers, American Backhaulers, Coyote. Now yeah. Mastery. Yeah, he might know what he's doing there. Is he good? Great partner with. He can see Brett. around the bend. Yeah. Uh, your customers and investors want to know that your company is serious about sustainability. Show them the depth of your commitment when you rely on AIT Worldwide Logistics for your freight forwarding needs. From Scope 3 Carbon Footprint Reporting to calculating emissions at a transaction level, partnering with AIT sends a clear message to stakeholders. You mean business when it comes to sustainability. Learn more at AITWorldwide.com. That's right, and I got a question for you. What kind of a trucking company needs to be productive, safe, and profitable to stay in business? I'll tell you. Yours does, wow. Dooner. You're That's right. why the folks who built KeepTrucking.com just rebranded to Motive. Go safe, go productive, go profitable, GoMotive.com. That's GoMotive.com. What was the motive, Your Honor? <laughs> no, you know what the motive was? A history lesson. History lesson, Michael Vincent. Uh -oh. For over 35 years, Fleet Worthy Solutions has provided a single source of solutions to help monitor and manage DOT compliance while mitigating risk for private and for hire carriers. With advanced technologies and exceptional client services, Fleet Worthy becomes an extension of your team to make your company go beyond. Compliant. Nice. All right, now let's bring up Dr. Mark Manera of the Trucking Fitness Company and also a contributor on BackTheTruckUp.com. Dr. Mark, making us legit with doctors on our staff. What's going on here? I hey, what's know. up, brother? How's it going? What's <laughs> happening, man? I love your article. Your Highway to Health is actually, it's, it's your most, you've only put up two articles, but it's your most clicked so far. A lot of drivers got good feedback mm -hmm. on that one. A lot of drivers, uh, you know, you brought up some good points in that one, that it's not about like, Burger King or someone dropping the next Beyond Burger or something like that, that you ah. need to get healthy or even a, a specialized salad. It's Seco, and a lot of those things exist on the menu now. Yeah, you know, I think I think way too many drivers, I've talked to brokers, I've talked to dispatchers who are eating fast food restaurants. I think there's so many people in trucking and transportation who are out of time and they have to grab something quick and they go to fast food and have this mindset of, well, I'm at McDonald's. Uh, it's just one meal. I'm just going to grab what tastes best. And, you know, for a lot of people, that's fine in the moment. But when you add meal after meal after meal and years and years of doing that, you know, things add up quickly. And what I, you know, really try to get to tell drivers and then other people that we work with uh, at trucking companies is that, you know, a lot of the times, you can't get down on yourself on the fact that, you know, you're going to these restaurants and some of the times it's out of your control, but hey, let's focus on what you can control. And there's healthy options at any fast food restaurant. Yeah, I thought it was really interesting, Mark, your points about uh, people almost, I mean, you implied that people kind of, they, they use the excuse that it's so difficult, it's somebody else's problem, they're forcing me to do this and getting over that. How do the drivers get over that? 
Yeah, you know, I, and it's it's sad uh, because I think a, a lot of people have this mindset of, you know, I, I hate saying the victim mindset, but yeah. it, it's honestly true because I think especially with a topic like health and wellness, a lot mm-hmm. of people don't want to put the blame on themselves. Um, and, and I think that there definitely are some issues, especially within uh, trucking and being on the road and the barriers that make it really difficult for them uh, to be like, well, uh, this is just my lifestyle. I can't do anything about it. And you know, what I really am trying to get people to understand is you have to do something about it or, you know, years and years down the road and after trucking or after your career and transportation and, and just being able to enjoy life, your health's going to get in the way and you got to do something today uh, because it's the best time to do it. Well, you know, there's like there's the there's the guy joke where you go like, oh, he ordered a Big Mac and a, and a large fry and then he got a Diet Coke with it. Ha ha. Well, what's that's a smart idea. Like, why would you want to drink 800 more calories of sugar? Yes, yeah. if you're getting a Big Mac and some fries, maybe you should consider water or something that doesn't have a ton of calories, right? <laughs> yeah. But there's such a guy mentality that feeds into a lot of this stuff, does it not? Like, a lot of just the, just our boys cracking on us force us to go and be like, all right, I'll just get the regular Coke. Yeah, if you're going to eat something bad, go all the way, right? Yeah, why not? Exactly. Right. And, and a lot of people look at eating healthy as this light switch moment of you flip it on, you're eating, you're eating the healthiest possible or you flip it off and you're going and getting Big Mac, large fries and a large Coke. And I look at it not like a light switch on or off, but a dimming light. Right. And most people are somewhere in the middle there. And instead of saying you have to put it all the way up and put the brightness all the way to that healthiest meal possible, what's one or two small low hanging fruits that can just get it a little bit brighter or a little bit healthier, right? And, you know, the small changes done over a consistent period of time are the ones that make, honestly, the biggest impact in the long run because too many people try to change everything at once and do this huge sprint and it lasts for about a day or a week <laughs> if you're lucky and then you fall yeah. off. And what? so, you know, changing changing like Diet Coke versus uh, a regular Coke can save, you know, up to 300 calories a meal. And then when you multiply that out, you know, you're, it's pounds added on over years of doing that. Go ride an exercise bike with a calorie thing on and then see how long it takes you to get to 300 calories burned and then realize that, like, maybe when I'm ordering, I should get the, the diet instead of the regular. It, it, that's a lot. Of, you're talking about, like, 35, 45 minutes of vigorous pedaling to get that 300 off your ass. Well, Michael, and and the, the thing that you're pointing out there, Mark, too, with the light on and off is that exactly. Once you start thinking those ways, it's hard to stop and you start living that lifestyle. Well, we're right? going to teach you how, but I just want to tell you how big of an issue this is here. And you actually just posted this a few minutes ago, and it said one in every seven of your drivers is costing your company. 2.3 more in medical expenses. And the reason for that is that one in seven drivers has type 2 diabetes, uh, more than double the general population. So a lot of issues. Let's help some drivers out here. Let's take a look at the first menu item from McDonald's that drivers can order when they're there. And it's just a slight menu hack. Tell us what's going on here, Mark. Yeah, so it's it's exactly what you said. So it's, uh, you know, picking uh, normally grilled options are much better than, you know, fried or, you know, Big Mac that has three layers of patties and a bunch of, uh, you know, calorie filled. What, what sauce is on a Big Mac? I, now I'm, I'm going special to special. What, Dude, it's special. You're not allowed to know. Special exactly sauce, right. The special sauce, right. <laughs> so, I know the you know, formula. You want the formula? Change, I know it. Yeah. Right, go uh, it but making later. these changes, it, it's, it's crazy. Like uh, from a medium fry, maybe even instead of having to jump to the salad, it's just going to a small fry. Right. And, and just having that mindset of it doesn't have to be this huge flip of having to change everything, but just making one or two small changes of a large Coke to a Coke zero or going from a large Coke to a water. And, you know, the impact of, you know what, that's 600 calories uh, in just, just one meal changed. And, you know, if you go out to eat once a day and you add that up, you know, five times a week, if you're working and, and you're driving or if you're on, out on the road, that could be seven times a week. And then you multiply that by, you know, 50, 50 weeks a year times 20 years of driving. And, and then all of a sudden you've got two different people standing at the end of that 20 years uh, just from that one mistake or one choice every single day. And so that's kind of what we're trying to do and flip that mindset kind of like you mentioned there of it doesn't have to be on or off. It's, you're somewhere in the middle and let's just push the needle a little bit closer to that healthy end. 
Well, you cut your meals, your calories per meal in half with that last one, which is pretty substantial. I mean, really think about that one. It's not Guys, bad. So you're talking about you're going to get your bad. lunch and dinner for what you were previously getting lunch for. And then if you think you're probably eating dinner that was either as bad or worse, and you're having a snack a little bit later on. But look at what John Brewer is doing to people when they stop by Carl's Jr. Let's take a look at this next one here. <laughs> here, you're cutting it. You're, this is 20. This is 75% less calories just doing it your way versus going for this, this Monster Angus Thick Burger. Well, yeah, and and talking about uh, guys being guys, who doesn't want the monster Angus? Thick I was just going to say, but that's itself. such a good burger, yeah. dude. Yeah. <laughs> so good. I, but but think about it. If if you actually ate the the meal on the right there and had you know the barbecue chicken sandwich, uh, a side salad, and, and still had your diet Mountain Dew, where you get some of that uh, you know soda in, uh, you're you're still going to be full after that meal. And if you're not then you can still add a small stack that will still be way under that 2000 calorie meal. And I think a lot of people just look at going to fast food as well. I'm here. I'm just going to go for it, but they don't actually see the impact that it can have on them. And you know, that's 2000 calories for some people. That's, that's as many calories as they need for the whole day. And you're, you're eating it in, you know, one, uh, you know, for some drivers, they're driving down the highway and they're not even thinking about it. They're just, going to town. And so I I think a lot of people just need to take a step back and, you know, think about, you know, what they're consuming, think about what options they're choosing at these restaurants and small changes can make a huge impact. All right. So doctor, let's say that, uh, to, to Dooner's point, let's say I want to eat that, uh, monster Angus thing at two, two and two thirds of a pound. Who doesn't want to eat that? Right. But I'm just going to go, I'm just going to eat that. And then I'm going to go out and run half a marathon, uh, while my truck's getting loaded. Is that, is that, that's fine. Most drivers are seven sedentary, right? Yeah. I mean, is that is that healthy? Just eat all the crap because I'm going to exercise anyways? Well, you know what? If you want to eat an Angus burger and you're <laughs> saying, hey, to, to, to eat that, I'm going to go out and exercise, I think there's some give and take there. I don't think you have to eat 100% healthy every single day, okay. every okay. single meal. There's some balance there. 80-20 rule is a great rule. I have, you know, for example, I have a root beer float every single night. My wife and I have this lower calorie ice cream, and we use A and W zero sugar. Uh, oh, wholesome! You and your what? Do you share a straw? And do you have to, like two straws? Now no, no, like- no, two separate. <laughs> I'm my my wife would uh, would never share a meal with me. I I'm a little bit protective over right. my sweets specifically. So <laughs> okay, I, you know you, you have to have you have to have balance there. Yeah. Nice. Well, hey, here's something that's really cool. So Mark, he puts out a weekly article now on backthetruckup.com. He's going to be a monthly uh, regular on What the Truck to give us all advice on stuff like that. And in between all that, he also runs the Truck and Fitness Company, and he has tons of stuff on social media. So where should I send people to to find that? Yeah, so uh, Dr. Mark Manera on LinkedIn or on any social media, you can look up the Trucking Fitness Company or our website, truckingfit.com. Thank you so much, Mark. We appreciate your time today. Take care, doctor. Yeah, thank you. Take it easy. Awesome so, you know what? I don't know if you do this, but but I do this, and it makes dieting hard. Is okay. like you go, okay, I went to the gym. So that's when you order the 2,000 calorie meal, but you may have only burnt like 300 calories. You haven't made oh, up yeah, 1,500 yeah, yeah. calories well, yeah. at the gym. So you actually gain weight by going to the gym and not like <laughs> yeah. muscle weight. You just gain <laughs> yes, butt weight. Exactly, yes, exactly. this is true. All right, Alex Strogan, he <laughs> can stop face palming now because he'll be on air. He's the chief commercial officer <laughs> over at the board of Vancouver. And uh, hey, you know what? I have this on here, but it's not windy enough to turn my blades, Alex. <laughs> So, oh, yeah. uh, I was just clearing the donuts off my desk here really quick, and, you know, but I think I'm ready now. So, uh, <laughs> There's a doctor in the room. Hide the contraband. Hide the contraband. <laughs> We're doing good. You know, Julie, so Julie uh, sent me this over from the port, and she had, like, a cryptic note with it that said, like, see if you can get the blades to turn. Um, I don't know if it takes wind or not, but the battery sure didn't do it. We got to mess with it a little more. But even as, like, a display model, it still looks pretty cool. It is sweet. They are pretty cool. You got, you guys got to get out here. You guys got to see these things up close and personal. There's something pretty cool when you actually get to put your hand on one of these massive turbines on its way uh, to its uh, final destination. Well, people can see some. If you play some of that B-roll in the background when we talk to Alex over here. But Alex, tell us a little bit about what's going on right now in the spring of 2022 with energy coming up that uh, big, wide and heavy corridor. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's incredibly cool. You know, it, it, you, when you wake up in the morning and you're in the, the logistics business uh, and you turn on the news and you get to see like, you know, a lot of the cool things 
you know, that are that are going on, and uh, and and you know, this is this is one of those things. Uh, you know, from a wind energy perspective, you know, nobody moves more wind energy on the west coast than uh, than the port of Vancouver. Um, what's interesting about this is the vast majority of this stuff is actually not destined to the United States. Uh, these wind blades, towers, nacelles are all being uh, trucked all the way from here on the west coast of the United States, all the way up into Alberta and Saskatchewan up in Canada, um, which is, I mean, that's a that's a thousand mile journey. Uh, and it's it's an incredible story uh, to see these things coming from around the world and then making this massive overland journey all the way up there into uh, into western Canada. So, Alex, why, why, why are they coming through Vancouver, uh, USA to get into uh, Saskatchewan and Alberta? Yeah, I mean, you would think, well, I mean, Canada. Has Mistake sports. on the entry docs. They're like, we're going to just send it to Vancouver. Just, yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, yeah. I mean, why, why are the Canadians not using their ports? Yeah. Um, and, and, the re- and the reason really is, you know, when you look at the British Columbia ports, um, and, and you guys see the pictures of these things, I mean, these things are just so massive. Um, and it really becomes about the clearance beyond the gates of the port. Um, so, you know, what type of turns do you have coming out of your port? What type of bridges, tunnels, you know, do you have um, that they, these things need massive amounts of turning radius and, and they're not, you know, they, they're not small. Um, and so, you know, the BC ports are just not set up in such a way that they have these types of clearances. And so as a result, uh, you know, these, these wind, most of these wind components going up into that region of Canada are coming in through our American ports uh, to, to get up there. And it's because of the clearances that our American ports can offer that the, uh, that the Canadian ports can't. I love the, uh, the beautiful Columbia River here. And, you know, we saw the blade in that first video, pretty exactly. obvious. What was the second thing that we saw that that was pulling? Was that like the, the stem that like, was that this part that they stand on? Yeah, so you've got uh, you've got these tower sections, which are these big, massive steel tubes, effectively um, that the that the wind turbine stands on. So you get your t- there's really three components. You get your tower blades, and then kind of the beating heart of the wind turbine, which is the nacelle. So this is the thing that the wind blades connect into uh, that sits on top uh, of the wind tower, and that's where that's where all that power is being converted down into electricity and then sent down, you know, into the grid uh, from there. And that's really the, you know, the three major components, the nacelle being the, the heaviest component. Wow. So, hey, Alex, let's talk about the federal protect, the production tax credit. Explain how that works and how yeah. that is affecting this wind energy. Yeah, so for for a number of years now, um, the the PTC production tax credit's been in play. It's a it's a federal government uh, program that basically gives a tax credit for every kilowatt hour of renewable energy that's pumped out of out of these wind turbines. A fantastic deal. It, it's really helped the wind energy business uh, over the past several years really kind of grow from it, its infancy to where it is today. Um, the extension uh, to the PTC is currently hung up uh, in Congress. It's tied into the, the Build Back Better legislation that we've heard a lot about um, in terms of you know, getting our country's infrastructure put back together again. Uh, so the hope uh, is, is that when the Build Back Better legislation passes, uh, that the PTC, which is a part of that, uh, will, will come along as well. Um, and that will really kind of serve as you know, as a conduit, if you will, for the next you know several years to provide you know these wind energy companies this incentive to keep putting these wind turbines uh, up around the country. So, what is the high, wide, and heavy corridor, and what does it mean to big mega freight like this? Yeah, so you know, I think the one thing that we really realized, you know, here in the Columbia River, that you know we we are all in this together. Um, and you know, it's not just what maybe the Port of Vancouver can do. Um, it's not just maybe what the Columbia River can do or the trucking companies, the stevedores. You know, we collectively had to come together and put together a solution um, that provided a, a route, a corridor uh, that took these large, heavy components, big, wide, heavy components, all the way from the ports here in the Columbia River, all the way to our hinterlands. So think about you know, up into the Dakotas as well as all the way up into Canada. And what this initiative really is, is mapping out that corridor that you can see there, getting the permits in place, getting the clearances done so that these you know, shippers that are making these decisions to move these really big components can look here into the Columbia River and see that there is a predefined solution uh, to get their products delivered. And they're not having to go uh, necessarily straight to the Gulf Coast, which uh, tends to be the easy button a lot of times for some of these larger projects. 
Yeah. So, Alex, what are some of the things that people don't think about when they're looking at handling the high energy uh, cargoes, these wind energy cargoes? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that uh, you know, it's, you know, these uh, these you, I don't know if you guys have seen them in some of the photos there, but uh, there's these steel cages that effectively go on the ends uh, of the wind blades or on the on the towers. They're they're called fixtures, um, and they're not small. I mean, these are massive steel structures that you know clip on, if you will, to the in each end of these things, so that they can be lifted up and transported either on a ship or on a rail or on a truck. Uh, there's a whole other ecosystem. Uh, on the reverse logistics, because those fixtures, once the components to the job site or the port of import, it's got to be removed, and then it's got to be shipped all the way back overseas uh, to where it to where it's come from. Mm-hmm. Um, it's something a lot of folks uh, don't think about, but uh, you know, there's this whole ecosystem that has to support that whole reverse logistics process uh, to get these things ultimately where they need to go. Well, as much as we like and support Lancy Reed, this seems like the kind of freight or you can't just give to any trucker or any trucking company, <laughs> right? I, we've actually done a segment on moving these things once, and you have to have a spotter and the driver and all of that stuff. How do you find trucking companies at the port to move the uh, the blades? Yeah, so our, our customers, you know, it's like the Siemens Gamesas of the world, the GEs, the Intercons, the Nordexes, you know, they have long-term partnerships, you know, with, with these. You're right, there's not many of these trucking companies that either, one, have the equipment, um, because this equipment that they run these things on, I mean, we're talking millions of dollars worth of, of equipment, uh, but the drivers who know what the heck to do. Um, I mean, you're, you're way beyond driving a, a drive at a dry van uh, around at this point. I mean, when you see these things that you've highlighted and you've got pilot cars and you're running on, you know, some incredibly tight turns and, and getting through some tight tunnels, it takes an enormous amount of skill. And, and I think if you talk to some of these major wind energy companies, what they would tell you is that, there's not enough of these drivers around uh, that know um, how to do these uh, drives and, and are willing to do these drives. And so it's, uh, it, it's, a, it's a struggle to find the right talent and then to, to, uh, to find the right equipment as well. It's constantly a juggling act for these major wind energy companies to get the right driver and the right equipment at the right place at the right time. All right, Alex, enough of these frivolities. Let's get to the hard-hitting <laughs> questions. The wheel of stupid. All right, what are we going to come yeah. up with this week? All right, all right, all right, all right. Here we go. What okay. Do you got? So, Alex, what is uh, the one thing you missed the most about the early 2000s? Ooh, the early 2000s. I missed I, I missed like not having to wear a mask, you know. I mean, we're so yeah, we were masks a lot, you know. I mean, I don't know if it, I, <laughs> It's just incredible. I'm, I'm so I want COVID to be done. I'm so sick of COVID. I mean, it's just like it's just amazing how still prevalent it is out there. I just want to go back to I want to go back to the time when we didn't have COVID. What a what a what a drag that has been. I'm with you, Alex. It's, and even this day, even in the middle of May 22, like a day or doesn't go by where someone I know says ah, I got COVID or the wife got COVID or a friend got COVID or something. Yeah. Got COVID. Fortunately, most of the ones that have said it to me, like everyone had been fine relatively, uh, yeah. relatively. You know quickly. what I miss? I go with the rock music that was up. Yeah, the rock music, but I really miss saying, hey, you know, uh, the ability to say, you know, remember 20 years ago, and I'd be talking about high school instead of my 30s. That's what uh, I miss the most yeah. about the early 2000s. <laughs> Alex, <laughs> Alex, thank you so much for your time today. Where do people go to learn more about Pan- Port of Vancouver, USA? Uh, so you go to our website, uh, Port of Vancouver, USA. So uh, you find me there as well as my whole team and, and a lot about the port as well as the, a lot about the highway heavy corridor. So, so great to see you guys. Thanks so much uh, for allowing us to be on again. Thank you, Alex. Take care, brother. Amen. Thank Thanks you back, guys. Take care. Peace. Bye. All right, a little big deal, little deal, then we'll send you home. Let's do it. Big deal. Little deal. Now, we started the show talking about a high school that didn't get it, right? Yes. The one in Kentucky. Well, here's one that does. Dave Dean, he's a high school truck driving coordinator. Put this up right now. He says, uh, celebrating Patterson High School's fifth annual logistics career fair. Thank you to our amazing industry partners. And I think we have some pictures from this, too. Thank you to our amazing industry partners and all the opportunities you offer our students Amazon, Granger, Fastenal, Bronco Wine, Bivio Trucking, CVS, Morningstar Trucking, Sierra Pacific, Diamond Pet Foods, DOT Foods, Foster Farms, G3 Enterprises, Home Depot, Michaels. Home Depot, by the way, was in that shipper of choice. Michaels right. and Restoration Hardware. Now, this is really cool. The school is embracing yes. blue-collar careers, secondary careers, d- careers in driving. They run a world-class program over there. I've already extended an invite to Dave. Him and his students will be coming on this very show, What the Trucks. You can oh, learn excellent. more about these programs. Excellent. B- uh, big deal, little. It's a big, a big deal. deal. 
Big I'm deal. saying it's a huge deal because yes. when you go in there and you dig into what they're doing, not only is it the kid who had problems with gangs that made a career, it's the it's the, the 4.0 students that's in there. I hear you. So topic two here, check this out. Around 7:20 a.m. Thursday morning, there was a collision between an Ohio Department of Transportation ODOT truck that was parked on the side of the road here. You can see it on the left hand side here, and a dump truck that veers off and just I'm looking smacks at the, it right. Oh, in this there. car on the side. Yeah, check it oh. out. Boom. There, now you know where it is. Look at that, dude. Wow. So what happened there? So they it rear-ended right into there. It smacked it over there. B- fireball. The Both drivers lived, although they did go to the hospital for, for injuries, but neither one died. They made it through that unbelievably. Unbelievable. Uh, it's, yeah, I mean, it's a big deal they survived. It's, it's, like, that was like scorched yeah. earth. That was a crazy-looking fire. I mean, Why did it the, explode like that? What was that oh, explosion from? My God, gas tanks, I suppose. I, I don't guess. know. It looks like one of those, you know, you see this in a movie, and you go, yeah, that's just special effects. That never really happens. So. Nope, there it is. All right, we got another video for here. Country music singer Tony Justin posted this video. Roll the tape. Keep going, Kate. I love it. Dude, they don't do that for me. That's going to sound like Lacey Reed's, Lance Reed's town in a couple days. I stand outside on Middle Valley Road doing that all day long, and nobody beeps their horn for me. Well, so it says, my fellow brothers <laughs> and sisters of the highway making the little boys and girls day during the LCNG Trucking Show Convoy. Yeah. <laughs> Real cool stuff. So obviously that's a big deal. We get a little cowbell for that one. What are you wrapping us up with? <laughs> oh, do I really have to read this? Yeah. So, uh, a fired Arby's manager admits to urinating at least twice in the milkshake mix, please say. <laughs> Vancouver, Washington. Dude this was picked gonna, up for having Are you Mark Manera? I'm never going to eat a milkshake again. Yeah, you I just know. cut like 500 <laughs> calories so, out of you. No, the guy claims he never actually put it in there. Yeah, whatever. But what yeah. happens is he, he, he was under investigation for, for child, child pornography. pornography they took phone. this guy's phone. Yeah. They take this guy's phone. He's under investigation for child pornography. They find a video of him urinating in the uh, the mix. It's actually it isn't too far from the uh, Port of Vancouver either. This Alex, is an Arby's stay on uh, Arby's. 221 Northeast Ave, Vancouver, Washington. He says, if you ever seen and you drank a milkshake there between October 30th and 31st, contact them. You might have drank uh, one of them his shakes. Hey, take care. Tell them how to be. Peace and love spread it everywhere.